Today's going to be all about objection handling. So we're going to dig in specifically to objection handling uh, from a prospecting context, from a sales context, and sort of start with how the landscape is going to change really, and it's already started changing over the next six to 12 months, just in sales and how on top of your game you need to be right now in order to hit and surpass your quota. So a couple quick intros. I got uh, Marcus Chan, my uh, Asian brother from another mother. <laughs> Marcus, if, uh, if you guys haven't seen Marcus's stuff, he's uh, just came out with a book, Six Figure Sales Secrets, Wall Street bestseller. Uh, and he's one of those sales trainers that has a lot of experience selling, uh, being in leadership roles in crushing quota. So Marcus, good to have you. We got Pleasure. Greg Refner, who uh, I think is the fourth webinar we've done in the last it three is. or four months, Greg. Um, Greg runs Abstract. And what's really cool about that tool is it, um, it's really unique for conversational intelligence and in that it will provide real time like coaching in the moment, like during a cold call or during a sales call. So Greg, good to have you on board. Let's start with kind of an interesting, like I think if we start really high level with, and Marcus, I'll kick this question your way first because you brought this up when we were prepping. You said in the last five years, and it's really actually 10, I think when I looked at the data, we've been selling in a bull market. And where were you kind of going with that in terms of how things are going to change over the next year or so? Yeah, absolutely right. So it's interesting. So when 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 the economy and the market's in a, in, a, in a bull market, meaning things are going well, right? People are spending money. It's easy to access capital funding. Banks are giving out money. Ultimately, certainty is relatively high. And when certainty is high for you know CEOs, C-suite, execs, the board directors, everyone, they're more open to have sales conversations. They're more open to spend money. They're more open to see the potential in things. Now, if you have ever sold in a bear market when it's the recession, like say, for example, in 2008, 2009, when, you, when you're selling a recession, when unemployment is in the double digits and banks are saying, nope, we're not giving you any money, people are running dry, people are running in the red, it is highly uncertain. And when you have to sell in an uncertain time, you realize pretty quickly you have zero room for error. Every single call, every single touch point, every single thing you do is heavily scrutinized because they're thinking to themselves, is this worth my time? How will you truly help my business? And if you're not able to convey that quickly, whether it's on a cold call or discovery or in a demo or anything else, they will shut you down. So in the last five to 10 years, if you start selling that time frame, you really haven't had to deal with it as much. Right. As long as you, if you had a good product and you and you work it worked decently hard, you probably have pretty good results. But back in the last recession, I realized working hard by itself was not going to be enough. So if this is your first time entering into a bear market, you're going to start seeing a lot. If you're already seeing a lot of people are very very skittish. They're very very scared. If you reach out to low level decision makers, they, they're scared to talk to you because they're they're being told to not you know not to increase spending to freeze budgets. So if you haven't sold before in a tough time, you're in for a really, really fun ride where this is a huge opportunity for you to step up, level up, and really thrive because most average reps in this time will start falling apart. They'll start quitting sales and they'll try to go to other careers. But if you choose to become better and you're already part of that by being here, you're on the right track already. So thank you, Marcus. Greg, we were talking about with Marcus right before this that the status quo, you know, uh, sales experience. You were kind of talking about a sales call that you just had right before this. What was that like? And like, do you want to kind of just set the stage for when you say, when we we're talking about status quo, um, like what expectations and like level of commitment and level of like activity and acumen, like do, does a seller need right now? Yeah. So the call I just got off of, um, Rep showed up, no idea what our company did, um, no idea who I was, what role I did, what role my position was in the company. Um, and if I went back and looked at the call recording analytics, I'm thinking he probably talked 95% of the time, asked two questions, um, completely ignored my hard stop. Um, needless to say, here's the thing, even if it was the best solution in the world, and I needed it, I would go find a different buyer or vendor to buy from just because of how bad um, that sales experience was. And so going back to like, what do you need to be successful right now? Like half the battle right now is showing up prepared for a conversation, whether it's a cold call 
or a demo, qualification call, a legal negotiation, a technical demo, whatever it is, spend five minutes preparing for whatever activity you're about to do. And I had a rep one time ask me like, if that five minutes adds up, and I was like, yeah, but that five minutes could be the difference between your $2,000 commission check or your $0 commission check. So in reality, that's the most expensive and valuable five minutes you'll ever spend during the course of that day. Yeah. Um, and so little thing just like with technology, um, if your company is invested in things like Zoom Info or LinkedIn Sales Navigator, which most folks have access to, um, you really don't have any excuse to not show up prepared because it should take three minutes to do some high-level research that puts you so far above and beyond the status quo just by showing up knowing a little bit about the company and the person you're talking to. Little things like that are going to separate the winners from the losers as we head into this um, kind of different time for selling anything. Yep. We have a, a friend of ours, uh, Bilal Betrawi. I don't know if you know him, Greg. I know Marcus, you, you know, yeah. uh, Bilal. But he likes to say in sales, we're graded on a curve. And the cool part is that most people are pretty bad at this. Yeah. It really does not take much to differentiate yourself from the nine out of every 10 sellers out there that don't show up prepared. And how does this relate to objection handling? Well, hey, on a cold call or on a sales call, if you can bring it back to something that's like relevant to that person or about the company or something that you saw about them, I mean, that little bit, I got complimented yesterday on a sales call. I was telling these two for showing up prepared. I'm like, what? You talk to other sales <laughs> trainers about an SKO and they showed up unprepared to the, like the bar is low, you guys. So bottom line here is that we need to, like we need to prepare, right? We need to make sure we're doing the basics and the fundamentals. So we're gonna dig into, when it comes to objection handling, we're gonna kind of look at this in a couple different parts. Uh, one, the mindset around it. And then two, we're gonna give you a lot of the, you know, hey, here's how to respond to typical types of stuff. But I'd love to hear from you in the audience. Drop into the chat for us. What is like your biggest challenge when you think about objection handling? Is it a mindset thing? Is it a confidence thing? Are you getting specific types of objections, whether that be over the phone on cold calls or on sales calls? Let us know. We want to customize the content for you today. <laughs> and this is also kind of cool, too. You'll get to see what everyone else is kind of dealing with yeah. as well. Drop it into the chat for us. Hiring freeze, no budget, too expensive. Hiring for this, but mm -hmm. I yeah. lot of status quo. Free. We're yeah. good. We're good. Pause everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Recession, uncertainty. Yeah. Piss, I call the wrong number. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <That> habits. <laughs> so let's talk first about. I want to talk about this mindset and conviction piece because. When a prospect gives you an objection that's related to a recession type of thing, we have a hiring freeze right now. Uh, I don't know about YouTube, but where my head sometimes goes with that is, hmm, how hard should I dig in here? Because I don't want to, like, I don't want to trigger this person if they're dealing with a lot of shit right now and to like have them close down and not want to talk to me. And I think that that discomfort right there, not pushing through that, that's the, that's a big mistake not pushing through it. And we'll talk about kind of how to do that. I'll kick this question your way uh, first, Greg, from a mindset standpoint, like having the conviction and confidence to just objection handle in the first place, I think is a really big thing. What advice do you have for reps to like really build that confidence so that when they get an objection, they really greet it and feel comfortable, you know, addressing it versus just ignoring it essentially. <laughs> um. I think that's a, a hardening that that just takes repetition of failure over and over again. Like you almost have to become comfortable being uncomfortable. Um, I think some of the best people I know at objection handling are also really good at persevering through other tough things in their life, whether they're athletes, whether they have gone through some tough times in their life. I think just kind of um, having a some some mental dexterity that you're confident you can persevere through anything is always a helpful thing. Um, the other component that I would say from a mindset perspective is so many reps I know, and we talk with when I talk with like sales leaders right now, they're still trying to push 
a message of grow top line revenue, grow top line revenue. And if you're talking with somebody who's worried about hiring freezes and budget cuts, they're more worried about staying alive and keeping their job. And so from a mindset perspective, you have to be okay. Like, can you build flexibility into your approach? Can you handle we're growing or, hey, we need to save money? Um, Can you handle those two things? And are you prepared for those two different potentials when you talk with a prospect um, and preparing for those? So kind of two things, just, you know, get comfortable being uncomfortable in life in general, because then little things like objections don't really bother you kind of learn to handle those tough things, but then also prepare for two wildly different outcomes, which will lead to two very different conversations. And you yourself, you need to prepare for that if your company's not helping you prepare for that. Take ownership of that yourself in terms of how your product or solution can save money or help somebody make money. Yeah. I think there's this something to tag on there, this welcoming, especially during the sales process, welcoming objections. I want objections and I want to get them early because the deals that you lose where you don't get objections, you're like, they have these objections. They just Yep. Never talked about them, you know, uh, Marcus, what are your thoughts? I know you talk a lot about mindset and conviction. Yeah. And that sort of stuff. Well, I think one of the most important things is um, I believe sales is a transfer of belief. And that's the same with leadership as well. And in sales, you must have the undying belief that your solution can help them achieve their truly desired objective. And if their desired objective is increasing profitability of their business, then you need to be able to have that belief that your solution can help them get there, whether it's directly or indirectly. And I believe in general, most salespeople aren't able to make a full connection for that, for that prospect. And let me give you a really simple example. So for example, uh, at one point I used to sell something incredibly unsexy and boring uniforms. Yes. Shirts, pants. Was it, wasn't it Speedos specifically? Well, or? I sold Speedos at <laughs> one point too. Okay. That was a different job. And if you can sell Speedos, you can sell absolutely anything, right? So here I am trying to sell uniforms, right? Shirts and pants, which is incredibly boring, right? And this is like, this is where we're still in the recession. And the reality is, is like selling them shirts and pants, it's going to make your people look better, is not really going to be what's going to get them to take action. But by being able to connect the dots for them and having the belief that if I sold their their team into wearing a specific type of uniform, then their team would actually be more productive, have the image they want, reduce turnover, and be happy for not doing, doing their own laundry, then they will ultimately reduce the turnover cost, which will save them money. And when they're more productive, they produce a higher level, they're more efficient, which ultimately increase revenue and reduce uh, increase profits as well. But the key is, is most decision makers aren't able to take something that's more commoditized and take it to that point. So if you have something commoditized or something high tech, whatever, you have to be able to show the bridge of the immediate benefit to the overall initiatives. But you have to have that belief in yourself. And if you don't believe it, then when you handle objections, if they say, I don't think we need that, you're like, I guess you're right. Okay. You know, oh, the recession, I guess you're right. Oh, it's expensive. I guess you're right. And even if you don't necessarily say you're right, but how you how you respond to that objection how you act in that in that time when you get that objection tells you everything. And ultimately, again, sales is a transfer belief. So when you get that objection, it should it should make zero sense to you. I always picture it, you should you should have an undying belief that your solution will cure them and solve whatever ailment they have. It's as if you are the doctor and they have an ailment. If they said no to, and they said no to the prescription, the surgery, the procedure that would save their life, would you actually walk away or would you push back? And when you have a level of conviction, belief in your solution, it comes through in everything you do from the copy you write to how you do a cold call to how you do discovery to how you do a demo to pitch to how you overcome objections. But only when you have a level of belief, are you able to do the work, practice, role play, and get comfortable with the uncomfortable? Because it is uncomfortable to handle objections. But if you believe in your solution and you know it can change their business, then you're going to do it because of that. The yeah. way I think of it, it's kind of like this. When you think about anyone who's got a passion in anything, let's say, let me see, does anybody do CrossFit? Just say, just say, say me if you do CrossFit. Anyone does any CrossFit? You do CrossFit, right? 
I think we'll drop it. Okay, God, God, no, no. All right. God, never. All right, not the people who don't do it. Any who actually does do CrossFit or yeah, let us know don't do CrossFit. do CrossFit. All right, me. Okay, or Orange Theory Fitness or one of those cool, like you know, I like, do Orange Theory. Orange yeah. Theory Fitness. All right. Okay, probably should. No. Okay, cool. Here's the thing. So when you, when you talk to someone who's passionate about Orange Theory Fitness or they're oh, swimming, so, mean, sure, so I'm a swimmer, right? So you know, Orange Theory Fitness forever, right? CrossFit. They are so passionate about it. Like, they're like, oh, dude, I go every Peloton single people. day. Peloton, Peloton people, right? It's like a thing. Like, you're like, oh, I don't really ride bikes. No, it's not a bike. It's an experience because they have a con- level of conviction, right? It's the belief. So if you could take something you are personally so passionate about that you have undying belief in and you bring it to the sales world, to how you sell and handle objections, you'll you'll be able to transform them much more. So we'll cover some things today, some tactics specifically, but if you can bolt on this level of conviction and confidence with the tactics we'll cover today, you'll be able to thrive in the recession. So I'm on a soapbox here. All right, back to you, Jason. <laughs> Dude, I love it. This will be the, and by the way, we'll get to the tactical stuff here in a second, you guys. This, the tactics and the stuff to say do not work if Mm -hmm. it sounds really weak and you don't sound confident. Okay. Like this Mm -hmm. is the part that you need to nail. A couple really practical things that you could do if you're kind of like, yeah, I don't know how I feel about this. Um, I call it drinking the company Kool Aid. So if you need, you should have a routine when you go into a sales call or into a cold call block where, you look on your company's website at the case studies and success stories, and you remind yourself of all of the great shit that your company does. Um, if you're a sales leader watching this, what I would do is open up a Slack channel, uh, or sorry, in a Slack channel where you s- share sales wins, start sharing customer wins too. 100%. So when an existing customer has a win and gets an outcome, like share that with your team. If you're a full cycle sales rep and you have, uh, if you're an account executive and you've brought in clients and they're getting really good results with the solution, like remind, like write that stuff down, take screenshots of it. I want you to have that stuff readily available so you can just like look and be like, okay, we're doing good stuff here. So Jason- You know what, this prospect is scared right now, right? Budget, all that other kind of stuff, but I need to remind them that that's okay. And we're actually here to help and guide you through that. Like you need to reframe that. I think Greg, you were gonna say something. Uh, Yeah, I was gonna say that um, oftentimes like good sales calls often get shared. Um, something that I think often gets missed over and is a, a great tie into that is like CS should be sharing excitement from customers, like take snippets oh, of customer reactions, customer, just like when someone's like super happy on a CS call, it's not, maybe that doesn't go on the website. Maybe it doesn't get documented or written anywhere, but share that stuff because oftentimes in sales, especially frontline prospecting, you know, if we're going to talk talk about cold calls, like we don't hear about those customer excitement points. We don't yep. hear about those things that customers are saying about the product. So share those downstream. And if your team, if your company's not, go ask for them. Like go talk with one of your CSMs, one of your support reps, and be like, hey, what are customers saying about the product? Can you share some examples with me? Because um, that'll help. That'll help for sure. I want to add to this because I think it's such an important point of stuff. Yeah. Bank so Go ahead, Marcus. Here's, here, here, here's what I mean. So this, I love you to use the term bank because belief and confidence is like a bank account, right? You're either doing deposits or you're withdrawing from them. And if you have a Slack channel or whatever, that's so key. So for example, even in my company, we have one just for wins and we share every single day, but more importantly, every single week in our weekly huddle with my team, I'll go through and I'll share the background and the story of what happened in that situation. So this will continue to instill belief. And I think mistake a lot of times if you're if you're a sales leader is you start off maybe showing some cases up front early on in the onboarding, but then later on, what happens is you get so much rejection in sales, you become trained, you become indoctrinated by rejection. And suddenly you stop, you stop believing in the product. You stop believing in the solution. You stop believing in the company over time. That's why typically once you're past the honeymoon stage, three, six months into a new job, you start thinking, is this really for me? Is this, is this product really this good? Because you might hear about complaints. You might hear about issues, right? So that's why you must cons- constantly, consistently fill that bank up every single day, every single week with the wins. So this way you indoctrinate yourself with the right belief patterns you want to have so you can have a conviction to handle objections. What well, Marcus said. It's just, mm. if, <laughs> if your sales leadership, <laughs> if your rep here is not doing that, why don't you get that started on your team? That's right. Yeah, exactly. Let exactly the reps right. know, hey, let's start there sharing customer wins here so that we can like build confidence and remind ourselves of why we're doing this. And we'll have good stories to share when we cold call people. 
Hey, Marcus, I was giving you a call. We're working with a similar customer, Greg, over at so-and-so is dealing with this right now. Their budget was frozen, all this other kind of stuff, and we helped them do X, Y, Z. I was calling because I think we there might be something for us to talk about here. Like, you want that type of stuff to share. Mm-hmm. Um, cool. I'm like, I'm like super fired up right now. I'm, I'm um, fired up, right? You can object. <laughs> you're like, you have, you, have a, you have stories ready to roll, right? You have to flow. It's, yeah. it's natural. Exactly. It. You need to like, uh, you need to, like, you just need an undying passion, like you said, uh, for fixing problems and helping people, not selling Correct. your stuff. Hey, like, I want to ha- answer Maria's question um, real quick that she just mm-hmm. put in chat, if we don't mind. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. One, one way to handle that, Maria, would be um, tell the story of why the founder started the company. What was the problem that he was looking to solve? Um, so early on in abstract, we didn't have customer stories. And so we relied on um, the story of why we started the company, what problems we were looking to solve and how our early customers resonated with that problem. And so you almost treat like the, the, the founding, the genesis of the company as the customer story, um, as a way to kind of navigate the other customer stories that you're looking to build with uh, your future new customer. And people will resonate with that. Be like, Ooh, I, yep, I get that. That is my problem. Um, and so it's an easy way to handle that objection. <clears throat> Great point. Love it. Love it. Stories. Stories are so critical right now. Like head off the objection. And we're, we're just about to get into the tactical stuff here. You can anticipate, obje- you know, you're going to get budget and hiring freeze objections. So start bringing in customer stories where you say that that's what customers are going through. Yet they're doing this thing that's helping right now that you can help with. You know what I mean? Um, okay. So. Next thing I want to segue into, let's get into kind of the, like, let's block and tackle for the next, you know, 15, 20 minutes prospecting objections. So if you're watching this, hopefully you're doing prospecting, even if you're a full cycle sales rep, hopefully you're doing some cold calling, sending some cold emails, that sort of stuff. Um, a stat, Greg, was it 91% of the objections that people get are shallow objections? I think it was yep. 91%. Yep. Um, I'll go ahead and kick this first question your way, Marcus. Uh, Greg, the the data that they have in their tool is really, really interesting. And what they essentially found is that a lot of the training around objections is for the wrong types of objections. Like 91% of the objections that people get in their software are really shallow brush off, not interested, not right now. I'm about to hop into a meeting, call me back later. It's all of those kind of normal kind of shrug offs. Um, how do you think about from a prospecting standpoint, um, how do you address those objections, Marcus? Cool. So uh, I love objections, right? Because they are opportunities to really rise above everybody else and dominate in your space. So I'm going to start with the, the, the one somewhat like I'm heading into a meeting because this one, and I'm going to tackle some of these other ones like, I'm not interested. I'm busy right now. We're under vendor recession, blah, blah, blah. Okay. So first of all, I'm heading to meetings is a great one because that to me, it's a shallow objection, but it's, it's a time objection. Now it could be real. It could be false. And the simplest way to handle an objection, like I'm heading to a meeting is simply book a time with them. That's it. And I'll show you exactly what I mean. I'm heading into a meeting. That's ex- literally exactly why I called. I figured you're about to head into a meeting. So do you have some time to discuss more detail this coming Friday at nine o'clock? What's going to happen when you do that is either number one, they're going to, it'll be like, well, I got some other objection now. Yeah, I'm actually not interested because of X, whatever. We have a vendor for that. We have whatever. My goal is to, I want to uncover what the real objection is. Right. That's, that's that's my number one goal. So that one's really easy. If you get that, I'm running to a meeting. You just go for literally booking a meeting. Notice how very specific I said that. I didn't say, well, is it possible? Maybe jump on a call then and then and let no, 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 no. That's exactly why I called you because I figured out to walk into a meeting. So do you have some time to discuss in more detail this coming Friday at nine o'clock? I'm I'm literally I'm narrowing their focus down to one set time, which at that point they'll say yes or no or, or give me some sort of objection. That's and I'm good with either one. All right. Now. That's the first one. Now, the next ones, these, these real, I'm, I'm busy, the recession, whatever, timing's not good, et cetera. One of the most important things is everyone's got a different approach. This, this first approach I'm going to share with you, um, some people are not going to like, it's actually going to make probably 99% of y'all probably very, very uncomfortable to do, right? But ultimately, all your growth is going to come outside your comfort zone. My goal is not to handle that objection. I just want to get to the truth as fast as possible. And one of the best ways is to be disarmingly blunt, but also to be able to have a pattern to kind of shake them up. But also on top of that, if you know majority of first objections are almost always the same, you can memorize one simple phrase and you can use it every time. 
all right? Like most, most of the time, all right? So they say, oh, you know, uh, budgets are frozen right now. You just say this very simple phrase, which is that's literally exactly why we have to meet. Do you have some time available at this date and time? That's it. I'm going to say it again. That's literally, oh, it's a recession right now. That's exactly why I call it. This is exactly why we need to meet. Do you have some time this Friday at nine o'clock? What will happen is if this throws them off on a Mac, they're like, what? And they're confused. And yes, it's very comfortable, but they'll be thrown off. And at that point, they'll be like, um, they'll either will ask you a question, a clarification question, or they will give you a different objection, right? So now we're starting to peel the onion a little bit, right? And they might be like, well, um, the, the thing is, is like, we're actually in a hiring freeze. Um, and, you know, we're just we're not spending any money right now. It's a budget freeze. We're a little bit worried about the economy. Beautiful. Now we're, we're peeled the We're now we're getting some information, right? So now is a beautiful time to incorporate a store like Greg mentioned. Dude, I, I, I totally get that. Literally, 90% of the companies I talk to literally are having a hiring freeze right now. But Greg said the same thing, but we literally sat down. We covered a few different ways to actually help increase the bottom line. So do you have some time to discuss more detail this coming Friday at eight o'clock? So no, sir, the incorporation, I'm incorporating a few different elements. You notice my level of conviction, right? Notice how I'm saying the words. Very important. Notice how short that is, by the way. I'm not going to a long monologue of like a like a 13 minute story about Greg. It's very short, it's very concise. I'm dealing with the objection. I'm going for the time. Right. But that's how you start fleshing out some of these objections. You start getting to the real root, like real root of what's really on their mind. I love that. I'm just dropping in to that There's on kind of that note. Oh, go like, ahead, go ahead. Marcus, as you're kind of, you know, going back to doing your preparation, right? So segmenting maybe your your prospecting list by time zone. So you know when you're about to call somebody, hey, do you have any time at 10 a.m.? And you're saying that in their time zone so that yes. when you know and they say yes, that actually is going to work for you. And so little things like that. Um, also, I've, I've seen it many times where reps will ramble when they get objections. The best thing, the best tool I ever got taught in my entire sales career was to hit the mute button after a question or a, some type of power statement. Like that's a, that's exactly the reason why I called. Hit the mute button and shut up so that that person now has to fill that void with what their true objection actually is. You'll get to that a lot faster. Mm, yeah. Nailed it. That's something can I, I, can, I, can, I, can I cover this question, Jason, right here, which is like, what do they, what do you Absolutely. say if they can't meet the time? Because I think this is a good one. Because they, they, oh, yeah. Because if you, if you know, so you uncover the surface level. Now you uncover the second objection. Now they might give you another objection, like, oh, I can't meet that time. Here's the thing most average reps give up at this point. Just so you know, they can give up to one or two objections. The elite rep realizes, ooh, I'm like one inch from gold. I'm right there. And the reality is, is when they say I can't meet at that time, that's not even an objection. That's just a logistics problem. <laughs> that's all yeah. it is, right? That's not, like, oh, hey, no problem. And this is why you have to have your calendar ready to rock. It's like, okay, no worries. You got to be fast. Hey, no worries. I can also, I can probably squeeze you in then little bit after that two o'clock. Does that work for you? Notice some some subtle psychological moves I did sit there. Let me see if I can I can probably squeeze you in, right? Scarcity. No one no one wants to meet with a desperate rep. Nobody wants to meet with a rep who's like, "Well, I got all next week open, so you tell me a time and we can meet anytime." No, why is your calendar open? Does nobody want your yeah. service and solution? You have to be very specific, right? Oh, like you know, I can't, I can't make that Friday at, at ten work. No problem at all. You know what? I'm looking at money; it's pretty packed. I'm already meeting with Greg. I'm already meeting with Jason as well, you know, at eight and at 11, but I can probably squeeze you in over at nine o'clock. Does that work for you? Boom. You incorporate some of these references as well of people you're already meeting with. Okay. This, this is how you start stacking your, your call skills on top of that, because you're incorporating these psychological elements and the level of conviction that's being brought to the table is like, Ooh, it's, it's so, it's so sharp. You cut through every objection. Like it's, it's like a, it's like, it's like a knife through butter. And when you have, when you, when you do it enough times, it becomes instinctual. And even if you make a mistake, you say something wrong, but you can flow. It's not a big deal, right? Like for example, I have a speech impediment. I grew up English is my second language. I have trouble speaking at times. I stutter all the time. So if I stutter on a cold call, I just roll with it because I'm bringing level of conviction and confidence to the table because I know the solution by back to mindset is going to solve the big problem. 
I, uh, I love those responses. The other thing I dropped into the chat is kind of a, a framework for thinking about the customer story. Something really simple that you can do. You should already have prepared customer stories anyways. Whether you're a BDR, SDR, or an account executive, or an account manager, or whatever, you should always have one customer story for every type of prospect that you're reaching out to. So that could be based on persona, could be based on industry, whatever it might be. But just something very, hey, we're hearing this challenge from similar customers like Social Proof Drop. They're dealing with you know budget problems, hiring freezes, all that kind of stuff. And what they're using our help for is to achieve this outcome. And that's the reason why I was calling you. Let's meet so we can talk about it. You mm -hmm. know, like that conviction of uh, sometimes prospects need to be told what to do. And Correct. there's a way to do that and not be pushy. I, for me, my secret weapon is just smiling. <laughs> I know people can't see you over the phone, but you'd be surprised. Like you can they hear feel it. you. <laughs> they feel it. Yes. It's like, the emotion, it's like, right? <laughs> yeah. It's like, Marcus, I, I totally thought that you'd say that you were heading into a meeting. That's exactly why I'm calling you. You're a busy guy. They're like, what? Uh, and then okay. go straight into it. You know what <laughs> yeah. I mean? It, it's just yes. like... There's there's lots of tools at your disposal here. Smiling is a really big one for me. So the disarmingly yeah. blunt, just so people kind of understand what that is, being disarmingly blunt, like blunt doesn't mean that you're an asshole to people. Right. Okay. That's not what being blunt means. I think that like people have this misunderstanding of that. Being blunt is just calling out the elephant in the room. Right. Doing that in a disarming way, there's lots of ways you can. I happen to just do it like by smiling and trying to laugh as much as possible when I interact with people. But there's lots of ways to do that. Address the elephant in the room. When someone says, I'm busy or I'm heading into a meeting, you know that that's not likely the case. Like just, just, just address it. That right there, just being bold with executives, you will earn so much respect by just being bold and asking for what you want. Mm, so These I wanna, are people I that like, came up and had to do that in their career. Respect so, and probably job offers. The one they'll, they'll say, hey, that was awesome. You come work for my company. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. And what's, what's really key is like, so whatever level you call them into, you have to speak at their level, right? So if you sound like you're a rookie and it doesn't matter if you're, if you sound like a rookie, if you sound like you're, I'd say incompetent, they will sniff it out ASAP. So that's why Greg got in a sales call with a, with an a, 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 we're not going to say from where he's like, this, this, this kid's a clown. Like, you know what I'm saying? He sniffed out ASAP. He, like this guy is not the same level we're talking here. So, but if you able to bring a level of domain authority and attitude to the call, it's really critical. And this is actually why when you think about handling objections on the phones, being good on the phones starts before you start making calls. It starts with how do you mentally prepare yourself to be have your A game on when you when you flip your dollar on, right? This is why peak performing athletes spend two hours before they get on their field because they're mentally getting themselves ready and amped up so they're ready to rock. And it goes into everything from their mindset to what they eat, how much sleep they have, to how they optimize their whole life to get to that point. Because you know, once you have the ball in your hands, or once you're on the field, or once that call goes through, it's game on. And the true the true pros realize, you know, pros spend more time in practice than actually playing the game. Amateurs spend more time trying to play the game versus in practice. So yeah. if you want to be... Yeah, if you want to be absolutely elite, you have to walk in prepared, ready to go. The separation is in the preparation. And if you know you have a 10% connect rate, right? And let's say you make 100 calls, that's 10 shots you have. You don't want to mess with 10 shots up, right? That might be the only shot you have with that prospect. So you have to, in, 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 in time of recession, you have to be on. So and back. Yeah. Oh, go, go, go ahead. Yeah. So, I'm, 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 I'm riffing here now. I'm going. That's okay. No, I, I love it. So Pam <laughs> asked like, how do you speak yeah. at their level? So one of the early things I learned was from Skip Miller. Um, and he talked about the different languages and he used like Russian, German, French. And the idea was like, if you're going to be calling a CEO, you need to use CEO language. Correct. You know, don't talk about the number of meetings their SDR team is booking. If right. you're talking with a CEO, a CEO level, you're talking about market penetration. Mm -hmm. You're talking about go to market strategy. If you're talking to the director level, what do directors care about? If you're talking for an individual contributor, what do those people care about? So going back to prep, like do that work ahead of time. But then when you do get that at bat, you do get that person on the phone, like again, control the fact that you know the language 
that that person is going to use. So when they ask you, what is this about? You're not calling, talking about a widget in your application. You're talking about the downstream operational efficiency of the company and what your tool can provide. So just make sure you know who you're talking to and what they care about because it makes objection handling so much easier. Here's a really simple okay, tip, so right? Like if, uh, sorry, this is really fast. So like, let's just say you call them the C-level execs, right? Of, of like big organizations, go listen to earnings calls. Listen to earnings calls, read the 10K reports, read the transcripts, look at how they explain where the company is going. It'll tell you so many things about their core initiatives, what their issues are, but the language they're using. So when you cold call a CEO, you're like, hey, I just listened to your Q3 you know, earnings transcript. It was real, I, I saw that you guys are currently struggling with you know, growing your bottom line because of this major acquisition you had in Q2. Wow. Now they're like, whoa, hold on a second. <laughs> this this person listen my already now you're already standing out. You haven't even said why you're calling yet, right? And when you can speak at their level, and it, it doesn't happen overnight, it takes practice. You become absolutely elite, and it starts with taking the time right now to actually invest in the game, right? Taking the time to read those reports, learn, study, and be around those people who are actually at that level. It's really really important, and this this is gonna become a, a weird a weird topic, but like. Take a look at your inner circle of people who's around you, right? If you got a bunch of people that are just kind of, you know, they're average players, that's how you're going to speak like. You want to be absolutely elite. You have to raise who you're around and start investing into how you think. So this way you actually can come across like an executive because that's what you are. You're a CEO of your territory. You'd love it. So one thing I would tag on the end of this is... The reason for your call and the reason for the meeting is not to do a demo of your solution or to talk about your solution. Yeah. <laughs> Executives do not care about solutions and software and all this other stuff. Greg, Marcus, they've already talked about this stuff. Like you need to talk about the bigger priorities and outcomes that people like them care about. And you should already have this stuff internally because your company has probably already worked with lots of companies exactly like this one and spoken to people exactly like them. So the reason for the meeting is to share with them how companies like theirs are tackling these problems right now. Like that is the reason for the meeting. If you talk about your solution, that's when you're gonna get a lot of objections of we already have one of those, our budget is frozen, all of that kind of stuff. So we invite a lot of unnecessary objections by talking about stuff that people that we're talking to don't care about, okay? So let's talk about the, cause this is another prospecting uh, one that's really common. We already have a system for that. We already have something in place. So let's say someone does get this objection. Who are you calling with again? Oh, we're calling from abstract. Oh, we already have a conversational intelligence. We already record our calls. We already do this kind of stuff. Um, Greg, I'll kick this question your way first. How do we handle that objection of, okay, we've gotten deeper into the call and someone's like, well, you know, we already have a solution like that. We already yeah. got something. Yeah. So um, pattern interrupt. Oh, that's awesome. What what have you enjoyed about working with that? <clears throat> um, ninety like ninety percent of the time they'll tell you one or two things that they like, but then they'll go right into without you even asking what they don't like and the problems that they're having with that current solution. And you just again hit the mute button. What do you like about that? Or what's that doing for you? Hit the mute button. Uh, I used to have a desk phone. I would hit the mute button. I'd walk away. I'd take off on my little scooter, scooter around the office and just listen to them talk and uh, come back around and go, that's interesting. Um, I'd love to share with you um, a couple examples of what people have found transitioning from Gong to Abstract. Do you have a couple of minutes for me to share some of those examples? Yes. Cool. Share one or two customer stories. Um, does any of that resonate with you? Yes, cool. Let's find 15 minutes to uh, take the conversation further. So um, I've just kind of made it a rule. If you are faced with a current like incumbent solution already in place, first gut reaction, what do you like about it? How's that, how's that benefiting you today? Um, because so often they'll tell you one or two things, but then people love to complain about the things they don't like. And so they'll immediately go into those things without you even having to ask ask for permission to share a couple customer stories meetings basically yours the i think i want to the thing i want to highlight you noticed we've used the phrase customer stories a lot in this webinar today 
that is the way that you handle most objections. Like customer stories, it's just, it builds so much social proof and we're talking about peers and that sort of stuff. I love what Greg shared. I have a little bit of a twist on it that I'll drop into the chat. So if a person does not share the solution that they're using, they just say, we're already taken care of. The tone is really important when you ask this and it's really, you're just kind of telling them, it's like, oh, that that's, that's awesome. Tell me a little bit more about the solution you're using. Or do you mind sharing what you're using right now? And then the, the thing that I like to do is, hey, got it, I'm curious. One thing I hear from a lot of you know, VPs of sales is that they really like this thing about that, but sometimes this other thing comes up. What's your experience been? And you can kind of tease and like, like what you want them to talk about too. And it kind of puts up some bumper guards there. Um, Marcus, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I agree with all stuff, right? And, and I think there's a really great question I just saw was like, what happens if like, they're just not really forthcoming, right? And you see that sometimes they're just like, they're not, they're not really open to like handle it, right? So I have a, it's a, it's basically, it's the same kind of framework that you guys already shared, right? But slightly modified. So first off, they say, hey, where are you using? Oh, you know, we, we already have someone for X. And, here, and let's be real here. If they've been around for a while, like in their established business, they probably have something in place. Otherwise, they would have already reached out. All right. So just keep that in mind. Like, like you have to mentally prepare, like majority of time you're actually fighting status quo. That's pretty much what you're fighting. You're always fighting status quo. They're doing it internally somehow. They're not doing anything or they're using someone else. That's like 99.99% of the time. All right. So very rarely you can call someone, you you, you go into what, you, what you're saying. They're like, oh, cool. Um, That sounds amazing. Let's talk right now. Now there's almost at least one objection, right? It's happened to me, to me one time and I've made literally tens of thousands of cold calls, right? I was shocked. They're like, like, that sounds good. I'm like, are you sure? Are you sure? Okay. Right, okay. <laughs> so, so now going, going back to like, let's just say that they're using a competitor, right? The tonality is important, right? So let's just say, for example, like, oh, we're already using someone. They don't, they don't, they're real, they're really kind of tight to the belt, if you will, with what they're saying. Oh, that's great. That makes perfect sense that you've been around for like 15 years. Um, if, if you don't mind me asking, uh, who exactly are you using? So I'm No, it's the tonality. I'm softening a little bit. I want to like, I, I want to put, I want you to disarm them and put them at ease and not be this over aggressive, like hyper sales rep. So this way, they're hopefully they're like, well, you know, yeah, we know we we're, you know, we're, we're currently using, um, we're using, you know, we're using gone. We're using company X, but we're really happy. We've had, we've had them for and some of the, the kind of defending and you can kind of tell like, oh, that's, that's whatever they say. say like, oh, that's, that's absolutely great. They're actually a fantastic company. Hmm. So that's really similar. Greg just mentioned, right? You're like, you're like, pray like that's a great choice. They're like, I need to disarm them a little bit, right? Now I'm introduce a customer story, and basically it's a modified feel felt found that you guys have already seen so before. It's like, you know what? That's actually Jason over at Blissful is actually using literally them as well. Super happy, but you know, actually we did. We actually sat down, kind of looked into the, what they're currently doing as well, and found a few different ways to actually complement, make a and create a better program that actually helps increase the bottom line for the recession coming forward. So do you have some time to discuss some more detail this coming Friday at 10 o'clock? Again, I'm just incorporating customer customer reference. I'm tying in a huge major benefit that's going to be probably relevant given the circumstance that he's probably going to be interested in. And I'm going to go for that close again. Now, one of the most common things, if you, if you pay close attention in, in all the objection handling um, patter, if you will, through this whole webinar so far, every time you end your statement, you don't want to just end your statement. You have to end with a question, a closing question to move it forward, right? You know, uh, Greg mentioned, I think it's like, you know, like, is that resonate with you, right? My personal one is I just go for a date and time. Uh, I'm a little bit, I'm, <laughs> I'm a little bit of a shark, right? Because I play to win, right? So it, it is what it is. But either way, your goal is like, you don't want to just like state it and then be like, state you're like, oh, they, they felt the same way too. And they switched over to us. Awkward silence. Yeah. You're now inviting another objection. So go for a close. Is that relevant? How about Thursday at eight, right? Person asking the questions Over. controls the conversation. One hundred percent. One hundred percent. One a phrase I like to use a lot. Do you have your calendar handy? Boom. Yeah, that's it. Boom. That's it. Or uh, another one too. I can't remember who shared this with me, but uh, do you mind if I make a quick suggestion? Like you share the customer story, and you know what? This might be a long shot, Greg. Do you mind if I make a quick suggestion? And usually the prospects like, uh, yeah, what's up? How about we unpack this at a time when I'm not cold calling you in the middle of your day? What's Friday looking like at ten a.m.? Love it. You know, and just go straight into it. Like, be bold. Be bold. Ask for what you want. Um, we got about 10-ish minutes or so. I want to shift <laughs> a bit more into 
some of the sales objections yeah. that uh, folks are getting. Um, so by this time, if you're on a sales call, I mean, the prospect has likely, hopefully they know what to expect coming in. And there was like good expectations where people are not expecting to get something that that they're not. So we're going to make the assumption here that they're they're joining this sales call because like voluntarily, like they wanted to be there and talk. So there's that. Let's let's make that assumption. I think um, one of the big things here I think would be good to start with is. If you're getting a lot of budget objections or we need to table this until next year, what I want to talk to you too about first is, are you even speaking to the right person? Because when I hear budget, you don't usually hear a budget objection if you're speaking with a true champion or economic buyer. And I think what's important to distinguish is that there's a difference between a coach and a champion. A champion at a large org is going to be someone that's a, a VP or higher. Like it's someone that has direct access to someone in the C-level. It's not a director of something or a manager of something. Those are coaches. So I want to start there before we get into like the objection handling. How do we know if we're talking to the right person? I'll kick that question your way first, Marcus. Cool. So uh, I love you using the term economic buyer, right? So I break it into four types of buyer types, right? There's an economic buyer, technical buyer, user buyer, and I call it a coach, right? And the mistake a lot of people make is they meet with a lot of what's called technical buyers, people who evaluate the programs, but they can't pull the trigger. So technical buyers, they can't say yes to you, but they can say no. And they'll often trick you into pretending they're the right person. They'll say stuff like, oh, it's pretty much me. I just got to run it by Jason, but it's me. I, I sign everything, right? If they need to check with anybody else, they are probably a technical buyer to be, to be, to be quite direct. Economic buyers... They can say no when everyone else says yes. I'm going to say it again. They can say no when everyone else says yes. They can also say yes when everyone else says no. So meaning, let's just say, for example, they have 150 k budget for the year for, for the sales tech stack. They could, they could say, actually, we're cutting that in half. Or they could say, ooh, I see the value in this proposition that, that was being brought forth. I'm actually going to go get more funding. I'm going to take out a business loan. I'm going to access more capital. That is a true economic buyer. It's not the person that signs. It's a person who also makes a decision. And some people make a mistake of, well, there's board directors. I'm sure there is. But I guarantee you on every board of directors, there's one person who holds more clout and influence than everybody else. What they say goes. And your goal is to uncover who that person is and reach out to them first. Right. So it starts off with number one, when you're actually prospecting, is your list built of economic buyers or are you trying to swim up are you, are you trying to run up a hill i'm telling you right now if you go to the executives first and you run down a hill it's way easier so number one you're prospecting properly and you go after the economic buyers number two once you're actually on the calls like a discovery call and you're diving in this is where a, a mistake is, is made a lot of times is when you're uncovering the decision making process many reps go very surface level so they say, oh, hey, so like uh, if, you know, if you do like our demo, you like our solution, um, you know, like, you know, you know, who takes care of like the paperwork and signs and who, you know, who makes that decision? And they're like, oh, it's pretty much me. Oh, cool. Check. They're like thinking like, you know, I've done happy, bands. Happy ears. Like, happy happy ears. ears. I'm so good. I'm so pumped. The elite rep dives deeper. Hey, tell me a little more about that. What do you mean specifically says pretty much you? Oh, yeah. I have to also get Jason involved. Cool. And what's Jason do exactly? Oh, he's a CEO. Great. Aside from Jason, who else is there? Oh, there's also Greg. Who's Greg? Oh, Greg is a COO. Oh, okay, cool. Aside from Greg and Jason, who else is there? That's pretty much it. Pretty much it? Well, you know, we want to get some of the end users involved too. Okay, cool. So who specifically are the end users? Got it. Okay, cool. So uh, first of all, let's, kind of, let's go let's back up a little bit. What's most important for Jason? Hmm. What's so, more for Greg? So you start wanna, diving. Oh, go I ahead, Greg. challenge that a little bit, Marcus. I'm be like, hey. Yeah. So when we go to Jason, how can I work with you to make you look good to Jason? Mm -hmm. So we get this done for you. Mm -hmm. When we go to Greg, or when you go to mm -hmm. Greg, how can how can I prepare you so that you look good when you go talk to Jason? When you go talk mm -hmm. to Greg, mm -hmm. um, you know. And then right after that calls over. You do an above the line email. I'm a huge fan of above the line email to mm -hmm. Jason, to Greg, to the people mentioned on the call. 
hey, just spoke with so-and-so. He's awesome, huge champion of the business, blah, blah, blah. You know, he's going to come talk to you about this, this, and this. Um, if you have anything you want to add, let me know. If not, you're in great hands with so-and-so, right? And if they're like, what the hell are you talking about? You immediately know you don't have a deal. Mm -hmm. And that's a exactly quick right. way to find out who the economic economic buyer is. Mm -hmm. Exactly I, right. I, I, because this is exactly like a play that we've been working on just with Outbound Squad in the last two or three weeks is engaging. Mm -hmm. And it's so effective. Um, I just like pause real quick. I think to kind of summarize what we're talking about, so you have some context, is that make sure that you're talking to the right person. So if someone that you know is not an economic buyer is giving you budget objections, like what you need to do is not talk so much about the budget and focus more on, is this individual sold? Outside, and you can just ask, hey, outside of budget, Marcus, what do you think about our training? Like, like if it was up to you, like, do you feel like this ticks the boxes for you? Like, make sure that they are sold first. And then what you're going to do is ask for permission. Mm -hmm. Hey, um, I know that, uh, you know, it sounds like there's some budget considerations, all that kind of stuff. What I've typically found when we do stuff like this is that if we can work together, develop a business case, we can take this up to Greg and uh, what they're likely going to want to see is the business justification. Are you down to like work on something like that together that we can bring together to your economic buyer. Cause if we can get them involved, I typically see this thing move and I really want to get you what you, what you, what it sounds like you want here. You know, like just get their permission to like work together with them on it and to like prop, like troubleshoot that. Like one of the questions I think that's super important to ask someone that you think is a champion is, have you guys purchased something like this before? Have you championed something like this before? And like red flags are when, no, we haven't purchased something like this before. We haven't purchased something that's this amount before. I have not championed something like this before. And then you use that as an opportunity to just really like coach and, and work with them. The objections, like budget and like pushing stuff back, like don't, like Ian Koniak says this a lot uh, to give him credit. Don't take a no from someone that can't give you a yes. Right. Like a person that does not sign off on stuff and does not control budget, like they can't say yes to you. And what I'll add to Jason is like, and I think the mistake that's very easily made is when we get to that point of budget, you're deep in the sales cycle at that point now, right? Like if they're giving that objection, that means yeah. you like discovery is a phase. And if you, the more you can uncover, like imagine if in the very first call, you uncover the core company initiatives and what drives them and who's all involved. Now it's so much easier to do the email Greg mentioned. It's so much easier to involve the decision maker. It's so much easier to go around. And when you start asking, like, hey, how will this impact the business? What's most important for Jason CEO? And they're like, I'm actually not sure. Well, in order to make you look really good, I think it's really important. Like, can we set up a time to discuss in detail so we make sure it aligns with their object objectives so you're a hero too? Yep. Yeah. And the more you can do it up front, the more you can engage. And it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to like bring them in every single meeting, the, 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 the economic buyer, but the more involved they are early on and the more you can tie to what's important to them, the better it's going to be. And that's how you will truly multi-thread. Yeah. That's, um, and getting that early, right? Like, yes, I've had a couple of deals where I sent that above the line email and it's all in how you write it, right? You got to make your champion look good. <laughs> yeah. But like, I've had people be like, hey, he has no business doing that. Stop engaging with him. Like, right. awesome. Totally great news because he said that this deal was going to be done in two weeks. And so I'd rather find that out um, earlier than later. And yes. the only way to do that is to go and, again, kind of be comfortable being uncomfortable going and finding those people that um, can say no to you. It's just as important to disqualify than to qualify, right? Yep. Like, especially if I was like, like a majority of inbound leads are usually non decision makers, right? They're technical buyers who can't say yes, they can say no to you. They're valuing the proctor solution. Like, once you're on that call with them, you, you want to find out as fast as possible is this a viable opportunity? Because what you don't want to do is go through a whole full discovery, a demo, a proof of concept, do a trial, go back and forth, negotiate, only have the exec above the line say, what are you doing? We have a budget freeze, <laughs> right? Now you're, yeah. you're, you're, it hurts you, it hurts your, it hurts your heart, hurts your wallet. It's opportunity cost. Yes. And just to kind of, again, give everything context that we're talking about is, is 
the, there's the, a whole give to get. This, we could have done a whole hour just on on this topic, but there's a whole give to get that needs to happen. Where like yes. if someone wants a proof of concept and the economic buyer is not engaged, that's an oh, ask. Yeah. Like we're not going to do this unless we can yeah. engage this person. Like you Don't have to waste be your time. Put down. Um, so like think about what some of those things are. And the bottom line here is that if you're getting objections from people that cannot say yes, like you need to think about how to have that conversation with them around getting, making sure they're personally sold on it and getting other people involved. Correct. Like it is all about multi-threading. That is how we avoid and handle these objections. And we got to run you guys here in like a minute or two. Um, I'll drop in ways to connect with you guys uh, here on LinkedIn and that sort of stuff. Marcus, where, where can people go? Where's the best place to, to connect with you? Cool. LinkedIn's awesome. You can get a free copy of my book, Discover Shipping Handling, closewithchan.com. Absolute pleasure, of course. We have to do probably a part two now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Go check out Marcus's uh, stuff there on LinkedIn. And uh, <laughs> Greg, I'll drop your LinkedIn profile in there as well, along with cool. your website. Where's the best place to go check you out, check Abstract out, all that kind of stuff? LinkedIn's great. Um, and this is... Uh, Sorry, Jason. I feel like we kind of went off on a lot of tangents and we probably didn't cover like <laughs> half of what we agreed to cover. So uh, this so is awesome. Fun. Thank it's you everybody good, for uh, your, your, your participation. Yeah. Thank you everyone. And Marcus, Greg, thanks to you too as well for the content. It was a pleasure. Yeah. Pleasure, Thank gentlemen. Everyone. Bye guys. See you we'll gentlemen see. later. Later everyone.